The headlines internationally read, Missiles rain down around Ukraine. Airstrikes at dawn as Russia begins war of aggression with Ukraine. Ukraine says, situation in the circle city of Mariupol is critical. We're in Ukraine, street in Bucha found strewn with dead bodies. A mass grave site with 440 bodies was found in the Zoom. I was sleeping soundly despite the fact that I forgot to turn off my notifications. None of them managed to wake my slumber. Then, a call from my classmate, a mere acquaintance, came through. My hazy first thought was, why would he, out of all the people, call me during the night? There was no way it was, it was a prank, right? Not at five in the morning, not this late. I thought maybe something was wrong and picked up the phone waiting for the worst. However, I heard nothing, dead silence. Now awake, I decided to investigate the numerous notifications and open our class group chat. The flurry of text read, you guys hear any shots? There are explosions in the Ibuki region. Just now, two rockets. We're getting bombed. Ivankovich, my body froze. I began to rock, whispering to myself, no, 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 over and over again. <laughs> so shocked in disbelief, I opened the Ukrainian news on my phone. The headlines reiterated my worst fears. A loud explosion, and a death is reported on social media. Explosions heard in Boryspil and Kharkiv. Multiple rocket launchers are hitting the entirety of Russia-Ukraine border. At that point, acceptance began to creep over me. My country was at war. Something that in the West we believed for the longest time was extinct, forgotten, and if happening, somewhere far away. Something I had believed had been relegated to the history books. But on the night of February 24th, 2022, my world was shattered. Reflexively, I dialed up my grandmother, asking whether she was okay. She was awake and had also heard the explosions. She assured me that she was safe for now. I stumbled out of my bed and into my parents' bedroom. I woke them by telling them it had begun. Equally demoralized, they turned on the TV, and as a family, we watched in horror as the first images of the war were broadcasted live. And yet, my sister was still asleep, innocent and unaware of what was happening. For a few fleeting moments, she would be spared the horror of her new reality. When she woke up, no one wanted to be the bearer of bad news to preserve her innocence and keep her oblivious for as long as possible, to prevent her from entering this world of war for just a tiny bit longer. That day, I racked up 17 hours of screen time. The phone almost never left my hands. I couldn't eat, move, or function like a normal human being. Anxiety and stress caused my blood pressure to spike, and this hypertensive crisis, as the doctor called it, ended up temporarily hospitalizing me. But the worst part about all of this was, I wasn't even home in Ukraine when the war broke out. I was hundreds of kilometers away in Turkey. You see, my parents managed to predict the war by comparing what's happening now to the past. When they saw that Russian diplomats were burning documents in the consulates, they got really worried. They told me that during Cuban Missile Crisis, Soviet diplomats had also destroyed documents before a potential outbreak of hostilities. And a week prior to that, airplane insurance companies began canceling insurances for planes on Ukrainian territory. My parents saw the writing on the wall. We got outside of the country 11 days before the war began. Because I was safe while my country was attacked, I felt like a traitor. 
I felt as though I had committed treason for not being there with my people. And if suffering was that tough for me in Turkey, I could only imagine how difficult it was for the people who were actually there. The guilt I had was overwhelming. The feeling of emptiness, dread, and regret was like a dark hole that was slowly swallowing me with its inescapable grip. I knew that this war would mangle and deform my country, my home. The childhood streets and friends had all been taken for granted. Looking back, I was so unaware of how lucky I was, how rich my life had been, full of friends, family, and security. You know, wise men say that you don't appreciate things until they're taken away. Unfortunately, neither did I until they were destroyed right in front of my very eyes. Parting ways with my friends was one of the hardest pills I've ever had to swallow. They had become like a family to me. We had inside jokes that could send us howling with laughter. All the shared experiences and adventures are now just a distant memory, only accessible on a camera roll. They can never be replicated. Mornings, laughing, afternoons, talking, evenings, nights, gaming, the breaks. We would spend together time talking non-stop about who we liked, our hopes, our dreams. All of it disappeared in a single snap that night on February 24th. We never saw each other again. That episode of my life was over. This family, which was once so strong, fell apart like disparate pieces of puzzle that can never be rejoined. And all of those great memories that we did in Kiev, Odessa, and Lviv, were the very cities which were being demolished by waves of missiles. Meanwhile, I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm someone who has food in front of them three times a day and a, and a roof above my head and all of my family members alive. Now, I won't bore you with a long history lesson, but some context and understanding of the history of oppression of Ukrainians is necessary. Ukraine was first established as a state in the 9th century as Kiev and Rus. Still today, the symbol on our passports is the coat of arms that harks back to that era. For Ukraine, the first of many sufferings began in 17 and late 1700s when Russia invaded and conquered huge swaths of Ukrainian territory, which they called Mala Russia, which literally means little or small Russia. The Russians practiced a policy of Russification. Ukrainian language was prohibited and then banned in schools and universities. The only language taught was Russian. In short, Ukraine was like a colony. By 1863, the oppression increased when a Russian policy paper stated that a separate, a separate little Russian language never existed, does not exist, and shall not exist and the tongue used by commoners is nothing but Russian corrupted by the influence of Poland. This was said about my language. This was also one of many attempts to demean Ukrainians and eliminate any claim that they may have had to national identity. This continued with the eventual banning of Ukrainian in print and mass imprisonment of exiled and so-called dissidents. The Russian Revolution, 1917, finally offered Ukraine a chance for independence. But that was short-lived. After setting up a national government, Ukraine was overrun by communists hungry for power and the breadbasket of Eastern Europe. The free-thinking Ukrainians were always suspect in the USSR, and the violence against them escalated quickly. The Holodomor, an act of genocide from 1932 to 1933, was meant to force the insubordinate Ukrainian people to submit to the Soviet government. Their crops and food were forcefully taken away from them. Fields and farms were left empty, and millions were relegated to starvation. It is estimated that at least four million Ukrainians have died due to hunger. The fall of USSR led to a free and independent Ukraine. Perfect, it was not, but it was ours. 
You see, Ukrainian was brought back to schools, literature began to flourish, and progress was made to join the EU. When we democratically elected a leader that pushed out the autocratic government, the response from the West was universal in their praise. But the Russian government began to ramp up hostilities. Now, I do not want you to get the impression that Ukraine has been a doormat throughout history. Quite the opposite. Many brave Ukrainians have fought back and been punished, tortured, exiled, or murdered because of their bravery. The tradition of rebellion goes back to the first invasion of our lands. Shevchenko, a poet known all over Ukraine, released censor poems as early as 1840s about Ukrainian national identity, telling us to unite and stay strong in our resistance. Borytese poborete, vam Bog pomagaya. За вас правда, за вас слава і воля святая. For centuries, Ukrainian underground practiced guerrilla tactics and remained a thorn in the side of their oppressors. Ukrainians in exile fled to the Austrian Empire, a diaspora that feels all too familiar today, where they continued to write, spread the Ukrainian language, and even taught it in primary schools. This Ukrainian grit has been stealing the limelight off the world stage in the last year. Their bravery and ingenuity in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds have shocked and awed the globe. Many predicted a quick victory for Russia, underestimating the determination of our people to hold our land. The rape and pillaging of our cities and the atrocities visited upon us have not made us submit or surrender, but they have made us that much more determined and that much more stronger. The damages caused to Ukraine and its people are extreme, and many are irreparable. Nearly 20% of Ukrainians have left the country to avoid the war. As of recently, 17.6 million Ukrainians are in need of humanitarian assistance. A developing economy that took so much effort and time was destroyed within a single year. 30% of Ukrainian GDP was lost. National symbols are getting torn out of the building's walls and facades. Museums related to Ukrainian history are wiped. Monuments dedicated to famous Ukrainian writers are demolished. 100 libraries are estimated to have been destroyed. Does this look like a city to you? Seriously, does it? Not really, right? Entire cities like Marinka, Mariupol, Bakhmut were turned into rubble. And now Wikipedia pages state that their population is zero or almost gone. Humanitarian crises still happen. Green corridors made for civilians to evacuate are shelled. Hospitals, schools, universities, theaters, malls are constantly bombed because they're claimed to be used by the Ukrainian military for shelter. Entire families died due to missile strikes. Countless children are left without parents. Many, street, many city streets were full of dead bodies. Some still are. Ukrainian POWs are maltreated and often share stories about maltreation and torture incarceration. Now, the purpose of my talk is to not make you pity me and my people or my homeland. I am hoping that today you will be spurred to action. Do not stand by idly. Do not let the support that has already been given wane as the war drags on. It is often the case that we as people respond to war with outrage and even horror. But as the situation continues, we become desensitized to the tragedy. We let go of our anger and move on with our lives. In short, we just move on. For me, there is no forgetting. There is no moving on. The only way that the victims of the war can hope for justice is if the people responsible are held accountable and if Ukraine remains free. But we need your help.
What can you do? Many things, big and small. Remind your elected representatives to support Ukraine because we Ukrainians are fighting for the democratic West for all of us. Take in a Ukrainian refugee, send money, food, supplies to our Ukrainians for organizations doing such work, fly a Ukrainian flag, keep the stories of Ukrainian tragedy and heroism in the discourse. But most importantly, please, please don't stop caring. Slava Ukraini! Thank you.